We'll continue what we were doing two weeks ago, uh, the overview of 1 Corinthians. And if you don't have that handout, we've got copies over there, but probably everybody has that. Uh, it's an outline of the book. Two weeks ago we got through the first five chapters, so we'll just continue from there. So in chapter 5, if we go over there, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We got through chapter 5 last time, but since it was two weeks ago, I did want to remind, because that's sort of a start of a new section here. And starting, oh, I'm in 2 Corinthians. Starting in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul starts to deal with issues that the Corinthians had. That, well, the first, the main issue was that they were following men and not following God's word rightly divided. We saw that in the first couple chapters where some were following Paul, some Apollos, some Cephas, and rather than following what God's word rightly divided said, they were following men, what men were saying. And the, and the result of that, the result of following uh, men and the result of really just doing their own thing, fulfilling the lust of the flesh, was that they were carnal. And it's not that, you know, as I said before, it's not where if you are in a sinful lifestyle, if you want to get out of that, you don't just tell yourself, well, I'm going to stop sinning, I'm going to stop doing this, and I'm going to try harder. You know, that's the flesh's response of trying to get out of it. The way that we stop uh, sinful lifestyles is through letting the Word of God work effectually in us, believing it, rightly divided, learning the doctrine for us today found in Paul's epistles, and letting that work through us. The Corinthian church did not have the doctrine that Paul presented in the book of Romans working through them, and the result was carnal lifestyles, such that they looked just like any other pagans out there. Paul had to find out if they were really saved. Did they really believe the gospel that Jesus died for their sins? And so he, of course, found that out. So now he's going to go through teaching them sound doctrine uh, through a couple of things. One, he's going to show them the carnality that's in their church, things that are going on. And then he's also going to show them you know, the practical application of how sound doctrine works out. So there are things that he sees sin, sin in the church that he's going to address in the rest of First Corinthians. And then there's also questions that they had for him. And through his responses to those, not only does he answer their questions or, or deal with the issues that were in the church, but at the same time he's showing them sound doctrine through that. And so on the outline I mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, how uh, in verse 1 he says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So they have such carnality in their church that it's not even something that the pagans would do. People who don't care about God and following what he says to do. Um, and, and so that, that issue there, and he deals with what they should do, but the main point to get from this, as I put on the outline, is that when you have the knowledge of God's word rightly divided, you have the knowledge that God presents, the sound doctrine that he presents within Paul's epistles, then the result is doing away with sin. And the fill in the blank there was those living sinful lifestyles would not be, should not be part of the church because the doctrine works effectually in them so that they are no longer in that sinful lifestyle. It's not something that they try harder, but rather they allow the doctrine to work. So that's why it's important that we read Paul's epistles and then by an understanding of Paul's epistles, we understand the rest of the Bible, and that's for our prophet uh, to work effectually in the inner man, to strengthen the inner man. So in chapter 5, the knowledge results in doing away with sin, and so then the next step, the next step in getting out of that sinful cycle or the carnality, is found in chapter 6, where knowledge results in not pursuing sin. So you do away with the sin, which is the example of the the fornication that's among their midst, in their midst in chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, you're actually, uh, not only have you done away with sin, but now you're not even going to pursue sin. And 
and I put on your outline there that chapter 6 is, Do not follow after the things of this world. This only fulfills the lust of the flesh. And he uses the what's going on in the church here is that they are having disputes among each other. They are taking each other to court. And the result, really, it, the bottom line from this is that if they were not following after the things of this world, um, that even if there were disputes, material disputes there in the church, um, they would really become a non-issue. He says down in, um, let's say in verse 7 there, in chapter 6 of verse 7, he says, Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? So, in other words, the question is, if you are allowing the doctrine to work through you, you will realize that you do not need to pursue the lust of the flesh, the things of the flesh. And so, I mean, certainly, you know, you're going to, you got to live in the flesh, you're living in this life, so you got to work, do a job, and make sure you've got food and clothing and shelter, all that type of stuff, but... Your primary fo or your your treasure is not that. That's just something that you need to do as part of living this life. So if someone is trying to defraud you out of something that is yours, the point that Paul is saying is, since you're not pursuing the things of this world, you know what's the big deal if you lose something? Even though because a lot of times people will say, well, it's not fair. You know, it's it should this thing should be fair. Well, you know, if you want fair then we shouldn't even have eternal life with God in heaven. Fair is that we're all, we've all sinned, come short of the glory of God, and we deserve our place in the lake of fire. It's by God's grace that He sent the Lord Jesus Christ to die for us, to be that atonement for sins, and give us the gift of eternal life. So when it comes to the things of this world, since the God of this world, Satan, is in, in control, and the course of this world is working through men, then... You know, we should expect you know, bad things to happen, and it's not something, you know, certainly we want to make sure we, we have what we, you know, we work for, but if it comes to the point of bringing division in the church or accusations, I mean, just, he says, you know, why don't you suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Why don't you just go ahead and let that happen? It's because the main goal is what happens spiritually, being able to have the edification of the doctrine in the church, and when you're going to war with each other over material possessions that in the end don't last for eternity, you know, why not go ahead and stop that? Why not just let them take your stuff so that you can go ahead with the spiritual um, growth in the church is what he's saying there. You can see in verse 8, that's of course not what they're doing. They're going after the things of this world. Instead of suffering themselves to be defrauded, chapter 6 verse 8 says, Nay, you do wrong and defraud and that's your brethren. So, uh, of course, you know, if everybody has that attitude of let's concentrate on the spiritual things, the things of this world really don't matter, well, then you're not going to have disputes. But instead, you've got the Corinthians here uh, trying to defraud each other. And uh, the key verses here, um, in verse 1, uh, on your second page of your outline where I've got the key verses, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, is uh, do not take saints at church to court. Uh, he says there in verse 1, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world should be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matter? So, um, you know, nobody's perfect. There sh certainly could have disputes within the church over material possessions. So when that does happen, why are you taking another to court? Uh, the church should be able to judge that themselves, and especially when you think about what he said over in chapter 2, where he talks about we have the mind of Christ given to us when we were, when we were saved, when we received the Holy Spirit. So, you know, why would you go to the world, why would you go to a judge in the world who doesn't have the mind of Christ and is going to judge, even if he does, even if he's saved, he's going to judge according to what the law of the land says. Uh, why would you go to somebody like that when you've got fellow believers in the church who are who have that mind of Christ and can judge? Um, 
that, so that's really the point there, and it's all the the main point of the whole chapter is that if you're not if you've got the sound doctrine that Paul gives in his epistles, and you've got that working in your inner man, then you're not going to follow after the lust of the flesh, and you won't be pursuing sin. So not only does Paul take care of the the problem of them going to law with each other and having these disputes, but he also shows them that um, really if you have the doctrine that is given in Paul's epistles, then this becomes a non-issue. You won't even pursue the things of the flesh. You'll just say, well, you know, I'll just go ahead and let myself be unjustly defrauded in order for the spiritual edification of the body of Christ to continue. And he says there in verse 12, uh, and that's another key verse I, I wrote down, he says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. When we are saved, as Romans 6.14 says, you're not under the law, but you're under grace. And over in Galatians, when we get over there in chapters 3 and 4, what he's going to talk about is, basically, when before you're saved, you're considered, spiritually speaking, you're like children. And then, once you have faith in Christ, you have that maturity by the Holy Spirit coming in, and by you being being declared saints and you have the mind of Christ to understand the doctrine uh, such that he no longer has to have you under the law but you're under grace you have the ability to make the decisions for yourself on what to do in life and that's what we're going to see in chapter 7 when it comes to the topic of marriage uh, but the point is here um, you know it's not basically a you know, right or wrong type of thing a lot of times in grace it's you're not trying to make a decision of well is this allowed can I do this a lot of times that's what you see in churches they like to come out with their commandments or things that you should avoid and you'll say well it's okay for me to go watch an R-rated movie I can do that well certainly you can all things are lawful unto you but that's not the question it's not does God allow you to do those things the question as a mature believer is yeah, he says, all things are not expedient. I will not be brought under the power of any. So is that something that is expedient? I could go to that movie, but should I go to it? And that's the question. Of course, you have to make that decision yourself, allowing the Holy Spirit to teach you the doctrine uh, so that you can make that decision. So uh, that's another key verse there to understand the perspective that we're in. Um, another one down in verse 16 that I mentioned is he's tra in chapter 7 he sort of transitions over to the topic of marriage they had some questions about that and when it comes to what God says about about relations with the opposite sex or sexual relations and marriage it's really you see none of that whatsoever taught in culture today it's just a complete what the world says about it is completely different and he starts off with that just by chapter 6 verse 16 where he says what know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body for two saith he shall be one flesh so I, I wrote on your on the, the key verses there that according to God uh, sex equals marriage in God's eyes it's not something that of course if you're getting married you should go before a judge and make it legal in the you know in the law of the land here but according to God it's something that it's the uh, relations that you have with the other person that makes you uh, married in God's eyes because he says even relations with a with a harlot or a prostitute is considered marriage because that act there is where the two become one so he's already before we even get to chapter 7 he's already getting the Corinthians into a different perspective here of what the world teaches because the world is interested in following the lust of their flesh and that sexual drive is a big thing and so they would rather follow that than following what what God would have them to do uh, so in chapter 7 um, when he talks about marriage again he's going to give them practical advice on what to do about getting married or not getting married or what situation you're in what you should do about that at the same time, he's going to show them how the sound doctrine uh, 
uh, progresses in in response to sin. In chapter 5 we saw sound doctrine results in doing away with sin. Chapter 6 it results in not pursuing sin. And now by the example of marriage in chapter 7 we're going to see that knowledge results in preventative measures to avoid sin. And really the, he's got it's kind of a long chapter. He got 40 verses here. It's all summed up in the first two verses of this chapter. Um, and that's why I put it as key verses. So in chapter 7, verse 1, he says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So really the summary of what does God think about marriage is right here. It's, it's interesting because you think of what the world would teach you, and even what Christian community as a whole teaches uh, a lot of what they, what Christians do is not different from what the world does. They're looking for that physical attraction and the good emotional feeling. And if they feel like they're in love with someone, well, then, they, then, then they'll be with that person and eventually get married. But then if they fall out of love, well, let's just go on and move, you know, get, sever that relationship and go on to the next one. A lot of it is just emotional and feelings. Even the criteria that's used... You know, looking for someone who is a certain height, certain you know attractiveness, whatever uh, they use all these criteria. Um, as far as God is concerned, there is only and I put in here on your key verses that there are two marriage requirements. Um, really, we should only have to say one. Uh, the the second one I mentioned is uh, marrying someone of the opposite gender, and that's found in chapter six, verses nine through eleven. Uh, where he talks about, I mean, he doesn't specifically say that, but you can see that in, ch in chapter 6, verse 9, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor executioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You notice in, chap in verse 9 there, chapter 6, verse 9, a lot of those terms there relate to the sexual relationships, uh, fornication, adulterers. The effeminate just means uh, not, in the case since men would be reading this as leaders of the, of the church here, um, it's talking about effeminate would be men who dress up like women. They're trying to be feminine, basically, and they're men. Of course, the opposite would apply too. women who try to act like men. And then the abusers of themselves with mankind uh, would be the homosexual relationships. And you know, this goes against what our society today, especially, that's really in the agenda of uh, what's going on, promoting and saying that homosexual lifestyle is okay and that's saying that really they can't help it, but they are born that way. Uh, you notice in verse 11, he says, and this would include all of what's in verses 9 through 10, he says there in verse 11, such were some of you. Um, so certainly there can be, in the lust of the flesh, the tendency to have those homosexual relationships or transgender or whatever terms that people use nowadays. Um, but at the same time, as verse 11 says, uh, that's not something that's just inbred in them that they have to act out for the rest of their lives. He says, such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified. Uh, when you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and um, you allow the doctrine to work through you, you can make the choice to allow uh, to walk in the Spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, and that applies to all lust of the flesh, whether it's homosexual or fornication or any any type of sin not just sexual but any type of sin and so I only bring that up that being of the opposite gender just because of the way society is today and what they're pushing uh, but as far as what's explicitly named in the text the only marriage requirement is found over in chapter 7 verse 39 um, at the your the person, um, if you find someone of the opposite sex and you want to marry them, God is okay with that. It doesn't matter how tall they are, how old they are, how you know, how smart they are, how beautiful they are, what, whatever 
criteria you want to use. Um, all God's concerned about is, are they believers? Are they part of the body of Christ? He says there in verse 39, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to marry to whom she will, only in the Lord. And so that's really the only criteria. Uh, but then, getting back to what Paul says in chapter 7, uh, when it comes to the decision about marriage, it's not something that should be done in the flesh. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting that there is so much in our society and within Christianity where people will... Uh, they base so much upon their feelings and emotions. You know, are they in love with someone? If they're in love with them, well, then they maybe would get to the point of marriage. But if they're not in love with them, well, then they would do that. Uh, it's interesting that in the entire chapter 7, in all 40 verses, the word love is not mentioned once. He's talking about marriage, and love is not a criteria at all. It's, are they in the Lord? Um, now, after you're married, you're told in Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives. Uh, so you are to love the person you're married to. But as far as making the decision, in other words, to get married or not, it's not based on do you love them or not. It's based on, or it should be based on, uh, as I wrote in the outline here, you know, the preventative measures to avoid sin, as he said in verses 1 and 2. Um, in verse 1, he says, basically, um, it's best not to get married. It's best to stay single. But in verse 2, uh, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. And as you go through the different situations that he talks about there in verse in chapter seven, uh, really the focus is on isn't on the things of this world. The focus is on the things of God. We are on this lot, on this on earth here just a short period of time compared to all eternity when we will be in heavenly places. Uh, so. That works two ways. One is that if you've, of course, all of us um, have that, well, I should back up. Um, in Genesis chapter 2, when God created man, he created man in his own image. And then, after, later on, then he took, of course, the rib out of Adam's side and he made woman out of man. And the reason he takes the rib out of Adam is that he creates a, another human like man, but the characteristics or how the, the woman thinks is different from how the man thinks. I mean, I don't have to tell you that. Everybody knows that men and women think differently. Uh, and <laughs> and, it's something, and it's, that's how God designed it. It's interesting that God, when he, God has these characteristics within him, you know, God is not female. He's he, well, he's really a spirit. God is a spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only uh, member of the Godhead who has flesh, and as flesh, he's a man. But he has um, he has the characteristics of the the good characteristics of God, both male and that you see you see some good characteristics in men in their minds, and you see some good characteristics of females in their minds as to how they think. Both of those are within God Himself. Um, God isn't female. I'm not saying that. I don't want to, you know, get that idea. But when God created man in His own image, then those characteristics, when He made the woman, He divided them out. For example, the woman, uh, for the most part, is a nurturer. She's somebody who makes sure that everything is okay with it. You know, the family and everybody together. Um, that's just a characteristic that she has, thinking of those things. I mean, for example, when we had Valentine's Day, my wife and I, she asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, well, you know, I, I didn't want to go out somewhere on a Friday night on Valentine's Day, because I'm thinking, Friday night's already crowded. Then you got Valentine's Day. Well, it's really crowded. I'm going to be waiting at this restaurant for who knows how long, and finally get seated, and it's going to take forever to get the food. So I said, well, you know, I'd rather just eat at home. Well, then she asked about, uh, inviting her mother over too, and I said, "Well, that's you know that's great." In my mind, I didn't even think about inviting her mother, but she thought, you know, as the as the woman thinking of the family as a whole, she's thinking of of you know her mother being at home and not having someone there. So you know, invite her, and we'll get together as a family. I said, "Well, that's a great idea. Let's all get together." But in my mind, as a man, not that I'm 
don't love my mother-in-law or not considering her. I just didn't even think of that. And that's an example how the woman tends to be the nurturer, thinking of the family, making sure, you know, the kids are doing what they're supposed to do and everything. And the man, he's not thinking of that. And, and so, um, but God, though, because he was, you know, God has both of those characteristics. Um, God, of course, we know him as the man of war, the guy who's going to rule with the rod of iron, uh, the Gentiles, and he's going to come and bring judgment. So you think of all these manly war things that he does. But the, you can also see the nurturing type of things with him as well. I want you to see a couple of passages. If we go over to Psalm chapter 91 and also Matthew 23, just to give you an example. And I think this... It may seem like I'm going off topic, and maybe I am a little bit, but I think it'll... I think when we have this perspective and understand, you know, why God made man and woman the way He does, uh, that that helps us in understanding marriage, and it's also going to help us when we get over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when it comes to the spiritual gifts, uh, why He brought about all these different spiritual gifts uh, to bring about His word to the Corinthians. Uh, so Psalm 91 and also Matthew 23. We'll look at the Psalm 91 passage. Uh, what I did was, it's real easy. I put um, I put the word wings in the concordance, and I looked up the verses. There are, um, in the book of Psalms alone, there are six passages like this. Uh, but I just picked this one out here, uh, Psalm 91, verse 4. That's to give you the idea of God as a nurturer, someone who takes care of his own. Uh, Psalm 91, verse 4, talking of the Lord, it says, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Uh, so you think of, it's sort of the idea of a mother hen, you know, making sure all the chicks are okay under her wings. Uh, that's not something the, the father does. It was, you know, in the hen relationship, you see the, the, the <coughs> female hen, or uh, one's a hen, one's a rooster. Anyway, you see, the, you see the, the female doing that, taking care of the chickens, having them under their wings. God is, does that as well covers thee with his feathers, under his wings shalt thou trust. The way he does it is by his word. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Um, so he protects by his word. So the reason we have God's word here is so that we may you know, be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. And us coming into the knowledge of the truth is a way that God nurtures us or keeps us you know, and protects us, something that we, a characteristic that we would think of as a female type thing. Um, that's something that God does for us. Matthew 23, uh, Matthew 23 and verse 37, right there at the end of the chapter, we see the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, um, born, was the second Adam. Um, he doesn't have the sin nature within him. Um, and you see him saying something that was similar to that or regarding... Um, regarding the Jews here, God's chosen people. He says in Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. So again, you can see that God um, has these characteristics. What we would, uh, And the point of all of this is that of course, everybody here knows that men and women think differently. God doesn't need to have a female counterpart to him because he has all good within him. All the, and not just the, the good of the man and the good of the woman. He has all of that within him. And so you'll say, well, what does this have to do with marriage? Well, what it has to do is that if you've got all these good characteristics and God puts them in Adam, then he takes this rib out of his side and creates woman, and she gets some of his good characteristics. So now Adam's got, you know, these good characteristics. Eve's got these good characteristics. That's where we get the physical attraction from, is that naturally, to be a whole person, you know, Adam was a whole person before the rib was taken out of his side. So now, since those good characteristics are divided, you've got some things that the man, he just can't understand how in the world the woman thinks like she does. And it's the opposite works as well. The woman can't understand why the man thinks like he does. 
not that they think badly, but because they were divided out in their, in their brain there when God divided out and made Eve and he's had Adam and Eve, well then there's that natural reaction then to become whole again before, uh, before God divided. Now the reason God divides them out